What's up, Discovery Church? Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. Man, I'm so sad because we're in the final installment of our Ephesians study series going verse by verse through this entire book, finally closing out chapter six today. And um, I'm excited to teach this. I really am. But I am also sad that we're, we're concluding this series. How many of you brought your Bible again to church? Can I see the Bibles one more time? I hope you continue freaking your Bibles, and I've loved like going through this with you and showing you how, hopefully, how um, easy it can be. It doesn't have to be complicated or complex to just read the Bible, open up your heart to what God would say to you. Like you can, you can do this. It's one of my joys to teach you the Word of God, but you can be trained yourself in the Word of God, and I hope that you do that, and I hope that this inspires you to do that. But today, um, we are concluding part six with the final part of chapter six, the final chapter of the book of Ephesians. And this is about, Paul is talking about spiritual warfare. So we're going to learn, and this again, for those of you that are catching up today, you can ca actually catch up online if you've missed any of these. But the Apostle Paul is writing to some new believers, Gentiles mostly, so people that are not Jewish, but they've converted to this new Jesus movement, this, this Messiah who died and rose from the grave. And there's this huge movement of people who are joining Christianity. They called them people of the way back then. They didn't have the word Christianity. They were just people of the way or the movement. And they were excited but didn't know much about, about this movement and this faith. So Paul, the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church at Ephesus, these new believers that are Gentiles, and really the surrounding believers in that, in that area, to try to teach them about this new faith, to shift some of their worldviews and philosophies and habits. Like, what does this even look like? How do we live now as part of this new movement under this new lordship, the one true God? How do we, how do we live now? So Paul's answering a lot of those questions, and he ends with a very important aspect of our faith. And that is spiritual warfare. I thought I would give you, before I jump in, let me give you a, a sneak peek. I've been working on a new book over the last, um, or over a year. There's been a couple years of work. Um, my new book coming out in August, The Spiritual Battlefield, coming out in August, where we'll talk about conquering the, the, the three primary arenas of spiritual um, warfare. And, and this is actually going to be combining with a series we're, we're going to be doing in August about battles and breakthroughs, 21 days of freedom coming in August. Excited for that, but we'll, we'll, we're gonna, or we'll get there. We'll get there. Let's, let's hone in here because there's gonna be, I'm just gonna do Ephesians chapter six. There's a lot more that's in that book and that'll be in that series. Let me start though with an amazing C.S. Lewis quote. It's gonna be up here on the screen. Look what it says. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devil's. One extreme is to disbelieve in their existence altogether. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, he says, demons themselves, are equally pleased by both extremes. And hell, a materialist or a magician in the same delight. Basically, C.S. Lewis is saying, there are some people who have this extreme thought that, uh, that they don't literally think about demons at all. It is not part of their worldview or their daily faith walk. It's just not a thing, okay? And then there's others that are just totally overly obsessed with demonic and spiritual forces. And, and he's saying, actually, both of those extremes, the demons actually delight and enjoy both of those extremes. So if you're here today and you're leaning towards even one of those extremes, if you lean towards, oh, out of sight, out of mind, don't really like to think about that, or if you lean towards like an obsessive thought or focus on them, I want to hopefully today bring you back to the middle, a balance. I want to bring you out of the extreme into the Word of God. Can I get an amen, somebody? So here's what we're going to do today with Ephesians chapter 6. This is how I'm going to break it down for us. We're gonna, Paul is going to give us, and we'll break this down, three foundational truths about spiritual warfare, and then the three essential practices that Paul encourages us to do. So we're going to know what we believe, 
But before we leave here today, we're going to know how to live it out. Okay, so let me start off. Three foundational truths. Take some notes with me today. Grab those. Grab your pen. Here's the first foundational truth, and that is number one. We have an enemy. We have an enemy, and it's not who you think it would be. It's not people. It's not your boss. It's not your spouse. It's not your, it's not your worldly enemies. The, the title of this message today is actually New Enemy. The entire book of Ephesians is about this new life in Christ, and, and we've gone through these chapters, and we started off with part one of Ephesians is about our new life in Christ. Part two was about the new family that we've been adopted into. Part three was about the new power, and then there was new rules, and last week was about new relationships that Pastor Veronica and I taught together, and today he's going to share with us a new enemy that you and I have in Christ. Let's pick it up where we left off last week, Ephesians chapter 6, starting verse 10. Finally, the Apostle Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against, he says, the devil's scheme. So we have an enemy. Here he calls him the devil, which means, that means the accuser. In other places of the Bible, he's called Satan, which means adversary or opponent. We have an enemy. Now, when you think about this enemy, you think about devil or Satan, these words, they might conjure up thoughts and images. So I want you today first demystify the devil. It's, I think it's important for us to understand the opponent that you're up against. How many of you think that's a good idea? Did anyone ever play sports up in here that you would have? Anyone ever do film study on an opponent? I remember when we used to play football back in the day. I, I loved actually watching tapes against the other film. I'm dating myself tapes. What is tapes today? Like, but we would literally watch tapes and, and every, every opponent was different. What, he, what we were seeking to do by watching film and studying our opponent was to know who they are and who they're not. And I wanted to know specifically, like I'm a strong safety and a wide receiver and a kickoff returner. So I'm looking at like their defensive backs and I'm looking at their back pedal and how they're coming out of their back pedal and what their break is like and if they have weaknesses. And I want to exploit those specific weaknesses for this specific appointment, opponent this coming week. So I'm going to study my opponent. So if you'll allow me today, I think what we need to do is use God's word as the film study against our enemy. And if you're taking notes, let me make sure you know who the enemy is and who the enemy is not, okay? Let's start here. Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us a little, a little bit about the enemy, the devil or Satan. It says this, you were anointed, Satan talking about here, you were no, anointed as a guardian cherub. So the devil was a created being as one of the guardian angels, the Bible says. So, and for so I ordained you, God says, you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. So he had intimacy with God. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. We're going to come back to this, but it's important to know that Satan is a created being. Till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread spread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mounts of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones or the presence of God. Isaiah chapter 14 gives us some more insight about him being expelled from heaven. It says, how have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to earth. This is where he is roaming and reigning right now. You have been cast down to earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart. Now, this verse gives us a lot of insight about the specific sin we just talked about and read about in Ezekiel. What was the specific sin of Satan? It was the I will sin. It was the sin of pride. Look what he says. I highlighted it every time he said I will. He said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, he said. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. The ultimate sin of Satan uh, and why he was cast out of heaven was his pride. He wanted to take God's place. He said, I will. And God said, no, you don't. 
So since that moment of his expulsion from heaven and him being removed, Satan stands in opposition to, to God. For Like, if God's for it, Satan is against it. He stands against everything that God is for. And the Bible gives us a lot of different names to characterize who he is and his agenda. Throughout the Bible, the devil is called the liar. He's called the liar and the father of lies. He's called the accuser of God's people. He's our adversary. He is the tempter, the one and his forces tempting us to leave God or to follow sin. He's called the destroyer. And the last one, the big idea of Satan is that he is a deceiver. So write this down somewhere. What is his function? Satan exists to destroy God's children and defame his glory. That is what he exists. That's his purpose today as a fallen being. He exists to destroy God's children and defame God's glory. Okay, but who isn't the devil? Who is he not? I'm so thankful that when I gave my life to Christ, the Lord has always put around me godly men to pour into me and to mentor me. And I, and I say that, and I'll give you a little caveat with that because some, I, I know a lot of guys who who say they wish they had some men around their life to pour into them. But I think what happens a lot of times is you stay on the outside and you never actually engage and initiate any meaningful connections. So you say you want someone to pour into you, but you're never, in, you're never signed up for a small group. You say you would love to have a mentor, but you don't serve anywhere. You sit on the sideline and you want someone to spoon feed you instead of actually taking initiative and getting connected. So, so I've, I've been very fortunate to have men pour into my life because I took initiative and I signed up for the groups and I attended and I, and I was there and I was studious and I served alongside and I, I put myself around people that were able to pour into me um, very early, just hungry for the things of, things of God. I remember when I was in Chicago, I was in my hospital corpsman training uh, as in, in the Navy and there were one guy who was actually, his duty station was there in Chicago um, his name was Chris. He was holding Bible studies. I'm like, I'm signing up for that. And so I went to that and sat with the other, you know, Navy corpsmen and sailors to learn from, from this uh, Pastor Chris. And, and I remember one day he's actually, he was teaching about the devil, this topic, and a little bit about spiritual warfare. And he decided to kind of play this game with us. He called it the opposite game. And I want to play it with you. Let's play. I want to say, I'll say the word, and then you're going to say the opposite of the word that I'm going to say. Y'all ready to play this game real quick, the opposite game? Okay, let's play this. Up, hot, win. There you go, lose. Yeah, left. Okay, now with this next one, don't say it out loud, but just answer it in your mind. God. Now, I don't know about you, but what I said out loud when we were playing the opposite game, I shouted Satan. And he goes, Chris goes, no, 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 no. God has no opposite. There is no one like God. Jeremiah 10, 16, 10, 6 says it like this. No one is like you, Lord. You are great and your name is mighty in power. Our God has no opposite. This isn't like Jedi and Sith kind of situation. This isn't like powerful light, powerful darkness, a balance in the force. This is not like that, okay? There is no yang to the yin. We're not like an Eastern religion. We have a God who is almighty, and the devil is a created being that doesn't even come close to our God. He is not all powerful. He is not all knowing. He is not all present. He's not omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He is not God or like our God. We have an enemy. The second truth that Ephesians teaches us, write this down. Number two, we are in a battle. We are in a battle today. That battle is happening. Sooner or later, every believer discovers that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. And that he faces an enemy that is much stronger than you are apart from the Lord. Let's look at what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil, key place, though, in the heavenly realms. So these rulers and authorities that we are against and that are against us and are um, against us, they're not earthly rulers and authorities. They are spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we are in a battle, not against people, against 
the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil. So anyone who claims to be spiritual, please hear me, and you're not a Christian, you got to realize that there's only the Holy Spirit and evil spirits. So if you're not being influenced by the Holy Spirit, then you're opening yourself to demonic spirits. So the word Paul uses here for this for this, str- this struggle, this war, the spiritual war, he actually uses struggle. And this word paints a very specific picture of the type of battle that you and I engage in. When we think of spiritual war, our minds might go to, I don't know, World War II stuff, guns and missiles and things like that. But that is not the word struggle that he's using here. Some of your translations actually use the word wrestle, for we wrestle, not against flesh and blood. The word picture here that is used is hand-to-hand combat. It is, it is face-to-face or close combat. This is intimate, and it's personal, and it's not every so often. It's all the time. Our battle is against demonic forces over whom Satan has control. These demons work to tempt us into sin. But remember, they were not created by Satan because God is the creator of all. The demonic beings are fallen angels who joined Satan in his rebellion and were perverted by evil. But don't be afraid. We talk about evil and demons and stuff, Satan. Don't be afraid, child of God. In the New Testament, it's not the believers that tremble before the power of Satan, but demons that tremble before the power of our God. In the book I'm releasing here next, in in August, I write about five spiritual battles because it's not what you think it is. Spiritual war and the spiritual battle that the Apostle Paul is talking about is not something in the clouds. It's not something mystical that you can't really engage with. It is a battle. There's actually, I talk about five of them. I'm not going to go into detail, but it is a battle for your minds. That is, there is a battle happening in your mind, okay? Right now, when you go home, when you're talking to your spouse, you go to work, when you're engaging in that conflict, when you're shooting that email, you are having a spiritual battle in your mind. The battle is for your identity. The battles for your faith and your obedience, even your relationships. There there is spiritual war targeting your relationships. Billy Graham, I love what he says about spiritual warfare. He says, spiritual warfare is not an option if you're a child of God. It's a necessity. If you're a child of God, you're in a battle for your faith. We have an enemy. We're in a battle. But here's some good news. Number three, we fight from the place of victory. We don't fight for our victory. We fight from our victory. Why is this true? Because Jesus went to the cross, which by the way, Jesus didn't go to the cross to win victory for himself because he was always victorious. Jesus went to the cross to win victory for you and for me. Here's what it says in Colossians chapter 2. When you and I were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision of our flesh, he's just making sure we understand we had no hope without Jesus. We were dead. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. We were in debt because of our sin. It stood against us and condemned us. He had taken it away, nailing it to the cross, And having, here is, remember the Ephesians 6 powers, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. He spiked the ball on them and did a little victory dance in the end zone, triumphing over them by the cross. He became sin so that sin would die and we could have eternal life. He died and rose from the grave so that death could be defeated and not bind us anymore. See, one of the, one of the names of, of our adversary, Satan, is actually the Lord of the dead, is one of his names. And this is because Satan was the originator of sin, or causing man to sin and to fall. And therefore, uh, brokenness, illness, and death ensued. We were never mankind. God's creation was never created to die. We were created to live forever, to rule and to reign with him. But because of the lie and deception of Satan, we have sinned. And now in brokenness, illness, and death dominates the human race. So Satan was like this lord of this dead called because he was the one that originated the death process in humans. And what Jesus did by becoming sin 
and dying, he descended into the lower depths, took the keys of death from Satan, and rose from the grave, defeating death once and for all. Death no longer holds us captive. Jesus is the Lord of death. And the, those who die in him will live forevermore. Amen? Amen? How do we fight from victory, though? Paul tells us, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, that's a key word in this section of teaching that Paul is using, stand, is used six different times in just this portion of teaching. In a wrestling match, you'd have, sometimes you got like a circle and the goal would be to knock somebody out of that circle. Hey guys, the cross has created for us a circle of victory. And as long as we are standing in the circle, we will be victorious in Christ. Okay, and I don't know if you ever played King of the Hill when you're a kid, right? The goal is like to knock someone off the hill. Our goal in Christ is if we stand firm on the hill of Christ, we have nothing to feel. We will be victorious in the victory of Christ. So here's the strategy of spiritual warfare. Let me say it like this. The strategy of spiritual warfare is simply standing firm in the victory that Jesus already has. That is the strategy. I'm going to stand firm in the victory of Christ. So this is the truth but how do we live it out? I want to make sure that you're equipped to step out in this crazy dark world and live this out. So let me give you three essential practices that Paul goes into to close out Ephesians chapter 6. Three essential practices of spiritual warfare. Number one is this. Build up your spiritual strength. Hey, if you got an enemy and you're in battle, it's time to start preparing and building up the strength you need to endure and be victorious. The first practical step of living a life of spiritual warfare and victory is in verse 10. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Literally translated, what this verse says is be strong in the Lord and in the might of his power. So we are strong in his strength. We're not strong because we got stronger. Your strength is not strong enough. You are not called, hey, get stronger. No, no, you find your strength in the strength of Christ. Which is why this word be in this scripture is so important. Be, he, he tells us, be strong, not get strong. Being strong in the Lord is not about human effort. So how does one be strong in the Lord. Let me just go there real quick because it's all the usual suspects, man. We got to spend time with the Lord in prayer, communing with God and having intimacy with the Holy Spirit. We have to have time in the Word and know God's Word. We should be baptized in the Holy Spirit and have the power of God living on the inside of us. We should worship and fellowship and be in small groups and serving and using our gifts. But it's not just doing those things that causes the strength of God. It's receiving from the Lord in in those things that causes strength to be built. But can I just speak to anybody today who's hearing, be strong in the Lord, and you're disappointed in even hearing that because you're thinking, I've tried that. I've tried. Like, I've, I've tried to be strong. I mean, I tried to read my Bible, Pastor. I'm try I've tried to pray, and I'm even being a good trier. I'm being a faithful trier. I try over and over and over again. Listen to me, please. The Bible never asks us to try. In fact, it asks us something very different that if you can catch this, it can radically change your walk with Jesus. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. It says, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. We're never told to try. We're encouraged and commanded to train. And there is a massive difference between the two. To try means to make an attempt. That's what it means to try. Generally, it's a pass or fail. I'm going to try this, and it's either going to work or it won't work. And many people, that's their approach to all things God. Okay, pastor, I'm going to try it. I'll try it, but I'm telling you, it, don't, it doesn't work, man. I'm trying. I've been, but train. Train is to engage in a process of growth. It will have ups, it will have downs, but overall, I'm just going to take it one step at a time. And over time, I'm going to grow strong in the Lord if I just don't quit. Because if I don't quit, I win. I will grow in godliness. This is what God teaches us to do. Not try, but train. 
And that's everywhere, by the way. You don't try to teach your kids to ride a bike. You don't, you don't hey, we're going to try to ride a bike. Because if you judge yourself on one pass or fail try, you'll never do it. He needs a, your kid needs a parent, a mom or dad to guide them. It's not about trying to ride a bike. It's training to ride a bike. Okay? You, you don't try to work out. Some of you, that's your problem. You're trying. You're trying to work out. I don't know, give it another try. Let me just try to lose. And then you go one day to the gym and you go back in the mirror and you're like, this mirror still is not working. <laughs> you don't try to work out. You train to work out. You train. It's a process of growth. It's a process. And there's a bunch of people who are trying the things of God. And you got to quit trying God and training for godliness. Let me take some weight off of some of you. You got to wake up tomorrow, please hear me, and just give another go at it. Just don't quit. Just, just read a verse, even if it's one verse. Train yourself. Start right there. A year from now, I promise you, you will not be at one verse. It'll be a process of growth. Just get up and do it, man. Even if you just pray, start, just pray. Even if it's one sentence, just train yourself. Don't try it. Just start training, though. And over the process of training to commune with God, I'm telling you, a year from now, you're going to be beyond that one sentence prayer. Train yourself. Keep training and build your spiritual strength, okay? Number two, essential practice for spiritual warfare. Paul's just trying to conclude this letter to new believers, and he tells them to put on the full armor of God. We need to be equipped for the battle that we're up against. And this, of course, is what Ephesians chapter 6 is famous for. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I love how practical the word of God is. Paul is intentionally using a metaphor of armor here, using a picture of actual armor that they'd be familiar with, that they would see Roman soldiers guard, guard, in the garments of this, of this type of armor, he's also alluding back, for those of you who like extra Bible study, he's alluding back to Isaiah chapter 11 and Isaiah chapter 59, where it explains the Messiah's armor. Okay, so basically what Paul is saying is suit up like Jesus. Jesus was armored up like this, suit up like Jesus. And here's a powerful revelation. Every piece of the armor listed in Ephesians 6 combats one of the characteristics of the enemy. Isn't God's word amazing? Every attack of the enemy, enemy, the armor is able to defend. Let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. The belt of truth combats the enemy's characteristic that he's a liar and the father of lies. He's never going to stop lying. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says we are to concentrate on whatever is true. To continuously think about that. Put on the belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness combats the enemy's characteristic of an accuser of the people of God. The enemy will accuse us and remind us of all the reasons we're disqualified. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. That I'm not righteous in my own righteousness. I put on the righteousness of Jesus. And my heart is protected by the breastplate of righteousness that I, it's not going to be penetrated by the accusations of the enemy. We put on the shoes of peace, which combats the tempter and the temptation to lure into sin. See, the Roman soldiers, their shoes were not like normal shoes. They were like cleats. They had metal spikes in the bottom of them, and they were used to dig, to hold your ground. So, so if the enemy will to come and lure us to the right or to the left to tempt us out of the will of God, I can, I can dig down with my shoes and stay my ground. No temptation, the Bible says, has overtaken me. God will cause a way out for you if you got your shoes fitted with the peace of God. And he says, take up the shield of faith, which combats the adversary. There's going to be a lot of weapons, but the Bible says none of those weapons he uses will prosper. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. 
In fact, when, if he, when Paul writes Ephesians 6, he says the enemy is going to throw arrows at you. They're going to be flaming arrows. And there's no way you can stop the arrows from coming. That's not part of it. You don't hide from it. You don't duck from it. You don't try to get him to stop. He's going to throw flaming arrows. But what's cool about this shield of faith is it just doesn't block them. If you read it, you remember it. It says it extinguishes the fire of the arrows. It puts out the ammunition of the enemy, the shield of faith. Take on the helmet of salvation that combats the destroyer. The enemy is after the destruction of our minds. There is a focused demonic attack against us, you guys, especially young people in the room. We have to protect our minds with the helmet of salvation. Isaiah 26, 3 says, my mind is in perfect peace. It goes on to say, because my mind is fixed on you. I will have perfect peace. We need to put on the helmet of salvation to to ward off the destructive attack against our minds in this world. And then he says, take up the sword of the spirit, which combats the deceiver. This is the primary attack of the enemy, deception. I love the sword because the sword is not, it's, it's both a defensive weapon and an offensive weapon. It's the only offensive weapon in the entire armor of God. The Bible says in John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is the sword that we use against the enemy when Satan was actually tempting Jesus in the wilderness. This is what Jesus used, the sword of the spirit. He used the word of God to combat the enemy. He didn't use a a meme, a quote, a, a, a lyric from a song. He used the word of God. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written, and the enemy fleed. See, the enemy will come at you in one direction, but he'll flee in seven when you use the sword of the Spirit. Here's the truth. God makes this armor available for every one of us. This armor, is it's it's available for you to be suited up, but only you can choose to put it on. I'm telling you, it's a crazy world that we're living in. It's dark, it's evil. It's deceptive. There's lures and temptations and landmines. And I've just, don't walk out of your doors of your house without getting suited up first. Before you set out, you got to suit up. Before you set out, I mean, don't step out in fear and doubt and confusion and, and worry. Put on the full armor of God. Put that belt of truth in place, man. Put on that breastplate of righteousness, your helmet of salvation, the shoes of the gospel of peace. Get that sword of the spirit and the shield of faith, and then you go out and fight that battle God's called you to fight. Here's the last essential practice Paul closes his letter with. Number three, to boldly advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you here that Paul is writing to new believers, Gentile believers who did not have the Old Testament. Gentile believers knew in the things of God, and he's explaining to them how to engage in spiritual warfare, to not be deceived that the enemy is targeting them, is against them, that they're not to battle against flesh and blood, but to see things spiritual, spiritual forces against them. And he also encourages them that part of the spiritual warfare is to boldly advance the gospel. These are new believers in Christ. Some of you here today have been serving God or walking with God or at least attending church for years and years and years and you have yet to engage in the spiritual battle that God has called you to engage in. Some of you have been in church for a long time and you've never shared your faith and the hope that you have in Jesus with anyone. And here the apostle Paul is encouraging new believers to fight this fight against the spiritual forces of evil and to boldly advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't need to have a special ability or calling. You don't need to stand on a stage. You don't need to speak eloquently. You're a child of God. You're called to fight this battle and boldly advance the gospel. Y'all didn't like that? Okay. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. He says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, he says, for whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should and as we should. And here's the revelation the Lord gave me as I was studying these scriptures. Will you write this down? 
The armor of God defends us, but the gospel takes ground. Let me say that again. That armor of God, that's what defends us from the enemy. But it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that takes ground. This is why there's no armor mentioned for the back of the soldier. Every piece of the armor in Ephesians chapter 6 is a front-facing armor. Why? Because we don't retreat. That's why. We take ground. We fearlessly make known the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we take ground back from the enemy. You want to write theology about spiritual warfare? Go read Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus said that the church will advance against the enemy in such a way that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We are called to storm the gates of hell with the gospel of Jesus and we are strong when we're advancing the gospel. We are at our strongest when we're advancing the gospel. A weak church is a church that has given up on the Great Commission, on advancing the gospel making known Jesus, making disciples for Jesus. But we must fearlessly and continuously advance the gospel. And that's what we've been have, doing here at Discovery for the last 10 years. Fearlessly advancing the gospel. People might say, what is Discovery Church doing? Building a new building. Why do they need a, why you guys need a new building? Can I tell you something? We didn't set out to build a big church here at Discovery. We're just engaging in spiritual warfare. That's what we're doing. This is spiritual warfare. For the last 10 years, we've been fighting for the souls of the people in our city, fighting for the souls of people. And the last 10 years have been amazing, but I'm here for the next 10. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep taking ground because life isn't a playground. It's a battleground. Can I, let, let me just celebrate with you. Over the last 10 years, we've seen 48,761 people come to know Jesus Christ through Discovery Church. Why? That's spiritual warfare right there. Forcefully advancing the gospel. We can't stop. We won't stop. We're going to suit up and take the gospel. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.